Hello, my name is Jim Christensen. I'm pleased to be here today with Dr. William G. Murray in connection with the 75th anniversary of the American Agricultural Economics Association. Professor Murray has been involved in agricultural economics for nearly 60 years. A brief list of his accomplishments would include such things as Professor Emeritus at Iowa State University, President of the American Agricultural Economics Association, Chairman of the Department of Economics and Soci Sociology at Iowa State University, Chief Economist for the Farm Credit Administration and Economist for the Bureau of Agricultural Economics, author of standard textbooks in the areas of agricultural finance and resource valuation, gubernatorial candidate for the state of Iowa, and Dr. Murray was recently made a fellow of the American Agricultural Economics Association. Dr. Murray, how did you become involved in the agricultural economics profession? Was there a particular experience, event, or individual that influenced you? Yes, it goes clear back to the year 1923. I was a student at Coe College, uh, in a junior year at Coe College, and I was trying to think about a career. And one evening in the newspaper, there was a headline on the farm page of the paper, and uh, the headline had to do with the problem that agriculture was having in getting more exports. And the author of the article was Professor E.G. Norse of Iowa State College at that time, who was head of the Department of Agricultural Economics. That headline and that article was the thing that captured my interest and imagination because for years, between the age of about 10 and 18, I had been working on my grandfather's farm in the summertime. I was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and was really a city boy, except that I'd gotten this chance to work with my grandfather and his son-in-law on their farm. And this experience on the farm, plus E.G. Norse's uh, plea for low tariffs so that we could expand our agriculture, uh, got me started in agricultural economics. And then, of course, from uh, that interest, when I graduated in 1924, I decided to go to Harvard University and get a master's degree and then see what I could do in the ag drive business world in uh, getting low tariffs and increasing exports of agricultural commodities. So that's where I started in agricultural economics. Could you briefly discuss your educational background and professional activities? Uh, it's uh, interesting that with the background of uh, E.G. Norse's uh, plea for uh, a better agricultural business situation for farmers, I decided that I needed to get some good education. And I'd heard that Harvard University was uh, the top university for economics. So uh, I went there after I graduated from Coe College in 1924. And in uh, June of 1985, which is almost exactly 60 years ago, I got my master's degree. And at that time, uh, the question was, what should I do? Well, there was an opportunity that developed to do some teaching. And so I had that to consider. But that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do because it was general economics. And I wanted something in agriculture. So I remember writing a letter to Professor C.L. Holmes. C.L. Holmes was head of the farm management and ag economics work at Iowa State College. And I told him I was getting a master's degree and I wondered if there was any opportunity to do some more graduate work but to get a job. Well, Holmes wrote back right away and said, yes, he said there is a half-time assistantship here at Iowa State College and with your training you're eligible and we'd like to have you. It'll pay a hundred dollars a month for nine months and you will have an opportunity to spend half of your time taking coursework and the other half the time we'll put you to work on some research project. 
So I came there in the fall of 1925, and the first thing they put me on was studying the financial situation. They took me over to the courthouse in Nevada, and uh, they started me out checking the mortgages and finding out how much the farmers owed on their land and how much they owed on their livestock on chattel mortgages to the local banks. Uh, this experience was fascinating because uh, it showed that uh, during the boom of 1918 and 19, farmers that had taken on an awful lot of debt, the same that they did in the 1970s here, mm -hmm. just a few years ago. So there's a lot in how I started out 60 years ago and about the same situation that someone would start out today. And I think that uh, some of the young people, some young ag economists who are starting out today uh, might have a big future in terms of the opportunity because the opportunity was sure good for me. I not only did some graduate work, but got a, as a result of the research, I got a bulletin out in Iowa State University in that first year. And the bulletin had to do with the financial situation in five areas of the state, the Four Corners and at uh, Story County, the well, county seat of Nevada, we got the records. And these records showed that there really was a serious financial problem on the farm. Well, as far as education is concerned, uh, I went up to the University of uh, Minnesota to do some coursework in 1929 and 1930 and uh, continued to do research work at Iowa State after I got back and got my PhD degree from the University of Minnesota in 1932. And that completed my formal education. But the interesting thing is that C.L. Holmes put me to work on that finance situation with one of the professors by the name of Fred Garlock. And Fred Garlock was the one who gave me some of the detailed uh, description of the things that I needed to do. And it was very helpful and it's rather interesting that the rest of my academic life was spent right in that very same field of finance and along with it, the uh, valuation of farm real estate, which was one of the things that came out of my study of the finance situation was, what's wrong with the way in which we've been appraising our land and putting loans on the land? And the same can be true to some extent of the way in which we put loans on our land in the 1970s and the trouble we're having today. It's difficult, apparently, for people to learn uh, about two generations and then they people forget. So that's the story, at least, of the education and how I got started in agricultural economics and in agricultural finance and in farm appraisals. Contrast for me, if you would, the severity of the situation in the late 20s and early 30s to those that exist today. There's an interesting contrast between what happened uh, back in the 60, 70, 80 years ago and what's happening today. Uh, there's some similarities. We had a land boom after World War I, and land went up, uh, clear up to $500 an acre then. This time in the 80s, the, the same land went up to $4,000 an acre. We, we did it up eight times higher this time. But uh, when you think about prices and so on, it was just about the same situation in terms of relativity. At any rate, the result of the land boom after World War I, we had from 1920 until 1932, we had a continuous down, down, down in land values. It was a slow process not nearly as fast as what's happened this time. This time it was the, not a, a land boom of two years, it was a land boom that lasted from 1972 until 1981. 
in the World War I, it was 1918 and 1919 and the first part of 1920. But in both cases, we went, we went off our rockers when we were buying land. We didn't consider how things could change. Anybody working in farming should know that conditions are not going to stay stable. They're going to go way up and they're going to go way down. And in the 1970s, people began to think that they never would go down. So that's the situation then. Well, it was pretty much the same after World War I in 1918. There had been no downturn since way back in the 1890s. And people had got the idea that farming would never go down. And as a result of that, they lost their bearings and began to pay prices that were out of line with income. Well, what I, what I, what I can say now is that looking back at the, my, at the 19, 20, 1932 period. It was a period of what we call the second mortgage depression to start with. People had both a second mortgage and a first mortgage when they bought a farm. They might have paid down, we'll say, 25% of the price for the farm. And they took out a first mortgage for 50% and a second mortgage for the other 25%. If you were paying $100,000 for a farm, you put $25,000 in, and you got $50,000 on a first mortgage and $25,000 on a second mortgage. Well, from 1920 till about 1930, we had a lot of problems in Iowa because we couldn't pay the interest on our second mortgages. And whoever had a second mortgage usually took over the farm or foreclosed. So we called that the second mortgage depression, and that lasted for about 10 years. And then we had, as many of you know, the big depression in the 30s. 1932, when the banks all closed and had to be reopened, that's when we hit rock bottom. The average value of land in Iowa was only $88 an acre then. Contrast that with the average value in 1980. 81 when we got up to $2,000 on an average value of farm. Well, at any rate, when 1932 came along, it was the first mortgage depression. You couldn't pay the interest on your first mortgage. And that made it real serious. And uh, Congress got busy, and there was a lot of activity. And that's the time when I was very busy working on organizing what we call debt advisory committees in the state to help negotiate settlements, prevent foreclosure. Because there was no use of a lender taking over a farm if there was a good farmer on there. The lender, in many cases, found out that he could lose less money if he kept that farmer on there and shaved down the loan. And in the, eventually, that farmer who had put a lot of money into that farm would do a lot more to save it and to pay the lender than a tenant who came on later if the, if the lender foreclosed. The lender wouldn't have near the support for the farm. Well, that gives you a little of the contrast between what we're going through in 1985 with what we were going through in 1932 to 1985. 35. Okay, uh, we, we've discussed some of the problems. Um, what were the contributions of the agricultural economics profession in the early days? And, and briefly describe, if you would, for me, what groups or individuals were basically responsible for that, those contributions? It was interesting that uh, the farming community, Congress, and uh, interested people, lenders, and others looked to uh, the agricultural economics group for help. They wanted information. For example, uh, these studies that I had made of finance, 
I finished my doctor's degree in 1930 and had the information on the situation in Story County, the central county in Iowa. And this information was grabbed by people. They wanted information. They wanted to know. Today, with our uh, polling devices and with all our technological uh, know-how in getting information, it's been much, we've had much better information than we had back in the 1920s and 30s. But we did have some, and of course, the fact that I had been working in that field gave me uh, an opportunity to use that information and get it out because people wanted it. Uh, what was the involvement of the Bureau of Agricultural Economics in the Farm Credit Administration at the time? Uh, there was, in the, the result of this depression, resulted in really three things happening. First of all, in our own Department of Agricultural Economics at Iowa State, where I was working on finance, uh, we had a series of uh, research projects on the Depression, and we gave out a number of bulletins with information, not only on what the facts were, but suggestions for how it could be improved. I'll give you an example from my own field because I knew that better than any other. Uh, we worked on a better method of appraising land because we found in our studies that the lenders had loaned too much money on the poor land compared to the good land and that a larger proportion of their loans to poor farms were foreclosed than for good land. What had been wrong was that the appraisers, the people who were determining how much should be loaned, didn't see the third dimension, the depth of the soil. All they saw was the surface. And as a result, on a poor farm that might have had gravel underneath, they never investigated that. And they loaned too much money on that farm with poor soil. As long as it was level or fairly level, they would loan heavily on it. And there were a lot of farms, poor farms, with poor soil that had loans that were far too heavy. So we got out a bulletin on, we called it the productivity method of valuation, in which we stressed the fact that in valuing land, the uh, soil was very important and the income you could get from that soil where it was tremendously important in determining its value. Don't be misled by the sale price. Find out what the farm is capable of producing. And that's one of the things that we did during the Depression. And I can remember the Aetna Life Insurance Company gave us some money to carry out that particular project. Now, the other, one of the other things was the Department of Agriculture in Washington, which expanded and was also very active at this time in helping farmers and giving them information and also on the finance area. And the third group, which was probably more important than any other, and that was the uh, Farm Credit Administration that was organized in 1933. They developed a program under Bill Myers and Frosty Hill in which they uh, got legislation so they could loan money to farmers to refinance their debts on the basis of normal value, higher value than the depressed value of that time. And through the federal land banks, they made this credit available. It was a, a marvelous program. And in 1935, the Farm Credit Administration inveigled me into going in and becoming their chief economist for a year and to work with them in this program of getting money out to the farmers. Uh, I've always been impressed with the fact that the, the government can do some things and do them well. And in this case, the Farm Credit Administration did a remarkable job in refinancing farm debts. I'll give you an illustration. 
Uh, we'll take a farmer who has a $16,000 first mortgage. That doesn't sound like much, but that was a situation in the 1930s. $100 an acre on 160 acres, 16000 And the farmer couldn't get enough money to pay the interest on that loan. And so there was a possibility of foreclosure. Instead of that, the federal land banks with the Farm Credit Administration's uh, assistance sent an appraiser out there and we'll say that he authorized a double loan, a federal land bank loan and what was called a land bank commissioner loan of 12000 now that $12,000 loan was uh, 4000 short of what the farmer owed. But it was all the farm could handle. What happened was that we had these debt conciliation committees or debt advisory committees that we'd set up in each county in Iowa. And these committees would hear a case like this one that I'm just telling you about where the farmer owed 16000 and the banks were willing to lend 12000 The Federal Land Bank would lend a total of 12000 Well, cash was so short in that period, you have no idea how little cash there was around. That $12,000 uh, carrot, you might say, was so tantalizing that the insurance company or other lender would say, well, if you can get me $11,500, I'll give up this $16,000 loan. And the other $500, you satisfy the other creditors and there'll be no foreclosure. And with these debt conciliation committees uh, helping on cases of that kind, we got a lot of settlements which, uh, prevented foreclosure. And I know men who were certainly happy because their farm, which was at that time worth $100 an acre, soon became worth two or $300 an acre. And of course, recently was up to $3,000 an acre. But now has been going down recently. At any rate, we had a fascinating experience. And one final footnote, the debt advisory committees that we had were small committees usually made up of uh, maybe three people. One would be a um, someone, maybe a retired judge or a retired lawyer who had legal background. Another would be a finance person who had retired or was well respected in his community. The third would be a retired farmer. So when the farmer who was in debt and the, and the creditors went to this committee, they were going before a committee that had know-how, expertise in giving suggestions. The committees had no authority, they weren't paid anything, but they did this in order to help the general situation in their area. Okay, given your involvement in ag finance, ag credit, resource valuation, after the depression of the 30s, I naturally uh, found myself in a less intensive, critical demand situation. And we started a course in farm appraisal, farm valuation, and then a course in farm finance. Well, the course in farm finance actually had been going, but we gave it a, uh, an update and as a result of the notes that I built up, I decided that we needed a book, a textbook in those fields, and this was the origin of the two books that I had a chance to be in on because there wasn't much of anything of that kind existing. It was a product, really, of the Depression and came after the Depression was over. We also started in 1941, a series on land value estimates in order to give people some idea of what their farm was worth each year. On November 1st, 
we would ask the brokers, land real estate brokers in the state, what the value of land was. And with their estimates, we were able to put together a survey that eventually gave a value for different quality land in each county of the state of Iowa each year. Let's talk for a minute about the attitudes of producers, uh, students, or farmers towards work done by agricultural economists. And specifically, could you contrast the attitudes that existed in the early days to those that exist currently? Uh, it has been fascinating over the 60 years that I've been involved in ag economics to notice the growing interest in agriculture. And I might mention the fact that I was uh, pretty uh, aggressive in my early days about trying to get ag economics uh, to people. And I wrote to the Country Gentleman, which was the major farm magazine at that time. This was in the uh, 1930s. And I suggested to them that they needed a column or a page in their magazine on farm management or on agricultural business. They had nothing uh, of that nature. It was either on crops or soils or livestock, but nothing on the economic angle. And I remember getting a letter back which discouraged me, I guess, in which they said they didn't think that the people were interested in this kind of information. And unfortunately, they were not interested in my contributing anything in this area. Uh, it wasn't too many years after that that the country gentleman went folded, went bankrupt. And I always thought, well, they just didn't keep up with the times. Uh, people wanted to know something about the financial situation. Ag business was ag business. And it was interesting to not only to farmers, but to consumers also. In the early days, was work done by economists, recommendations, and so on and so forth. Were they well perceived by producers? Uh, there was a growing uh, interest. And of course, the thing that showed the growing interest was the fact that in the newspapers and in magazines like uh, Wallace's Farmer and Successful Farming out here in this area, Farm Journal, uh, a growing amount of agricultural economic information. And at, for instance, at Iowa State College, uh, when I first went there, the Ag Economics Department was in two rooms at the top of, of old Curtis Hall. Well, we occupy pretty much a whole building today. Uh, there's just a definite demand, and the demand has grown. OK. Let's talk about analytical tools used by our profession. Um, in your opinion, which analytical tools or techniques have had the greatest impact on our profession? And were these tools generally accepted when they first appeared? Uh, the calculating machine, of course, has been the standby. And of course, recently, the computer has come in. Uh, there's been a growing use of the statistical tools. Uh, and it was my good fortune when I started out in the 20s uh, to get gather financial information that there was a machine called the Hollerith machine. And it had a system of cards that you punched holes in. And when you punched the holes in the card, you did it to show the data that you had. It had, it had the card had 45 columns, and you could get 45 columns of information. If you, if you were putting down amounts and you used four columns for like $3,465, that used four columns, and you had 45 columns. But then after you got these cards with the holes in them, you could run them through machines and the machines would add, and subtract, and make all kinds of calculations for you. Well, when I had my 
doctor's thesis on the financial situation in Story County, I used 25,000 of those cards. And my thesis was largely a, a collection of data that I got by using these machines, which uh, I did because of the statistical laboratory at Iowa State College, which uh, helped me in getting into this new type of machinery. It was uh, interesting that the IBM company, International Business Machines, was just starting up at that time. Well, they'd been going for some time, but they were interested in this, uh, these machines with the cards. And they put out a magazine called Think, T-H-I-N-K. And one of the tragic parts of my life is that I didn't take that T-H-I-N-K seriously enough, because if I had, I would have invested the few nickels and dimes that I had and saved, I'd invested it in some of the IBM stock because these machines were fascinating and they did a marvelous job. But instead, what a few nickels and dimes I had, I bought some US steel instead of some IBM. And you can imagine if I'd bought IBM and all the splits and things that have happened since I probably would have gotten so rich that I would have quit ag economics. Fortunately, in one respect, then I can say that maybe it was okay that I didn't invest in IBM because I've enjoyed ag economics and, am, and have no regrets the fact that I have been able to get a great deal of satisfaction out of watching the development of ag economics. No, the tools of the ag economists are two major ones. They are, the, of course, the statistical calculating tools, including the computer. But they also are what you have in your mind. There is still no substitute for logical thinking. There is no substitute for the quality of putting things together and working out solutions in your head. We sometimes are talking about how much we can get out of a machine and that the machines will be able to do thinking and intellectual work and so on. But most of what we'll be able to get out of the machines will be what we put into them and how we, with our head, with our brains, how we ask them to do things. You can't get away from the intellectual requirement. Um, quite often we read about the qualitative versus the quantitative evolution in the profession of agricultural economics. Was that evolution calm, peaceful? Uh, there's been uh, a lot of discussion about the qualitative versus the quantitative. In many respects, I suppose the quantitative, the statistical, the making of models, the development of uh, statistical ag economics has been uh, more, more impressive and has involved people more than uh, the qualitative, the philosophical. My own view is that uh, they both are necessary and that sometimes we get enamored with our statistics and forget that the qualitative, the thinking part of it, is going to be and deserves to be equally important. Okay, having had a very rich and incredibly diverse career, what would you tell someone who is about to embark upon a career in agricultural economics about the recipe for success? Well, uh, my experience has been interesting. When I first started out teaching, uh, I taught students in ag agriculture, economics, and most of those students were from the farm. And what was interesting to me was that practically all of them wanted to go out into business to get a job with John Deere or Swift Packing or Quaker Oats or some, some fertilizer company. 
Very few of them were interested in going back to the farm, even though their dad or their father of the girl they married had a farm. They were not attracted to the farm. And the reason they weren't was because the farm had no challenge. It was going back to a routine type of job of getting up in the morning and harnessing those horses and sitting behind a plow all day or forking manure, but something that was lacking and that something was a challenge. Fifty years later, when I quit teaching, it was interesting that most students in my classes who came from a farm were interested in going back to a farm. By that time, the farm had become a challenge. It was three or four times as large, and it required all kinds of inputs. It required strategy and marketing, in farm management, in the use of fertilizers and seeds and things, herbicides, insecticides. It was big business, and it was challenging business. And although we have fewer farmers, we have farmers who are entrepreneurs in the real, honest sense of the word. So one of the things that I can say is that farming itself is going to be, from now on, just as it has developed, a real challenging job. But that's not the only one for ag economics. What's interesting to me is that most large business concerns that are in ag agricultural business of one kind or another. They want ag economists. So when I go back over 60 years, I find that there never in all of those 60 years has been any extended period when a fellow couldn't get a good job in ag economics, which would be uh, equal to his ability. You didn't have to take an inferior job. There was always something in the last 60 years available. We never had a surplus of ag economists that I can remember that didn't very soon disappear. People could get jobs, and they couldn't get jobs teaching and research. They could get them in ag business, various agricultural business. And as I look ahead, that's going to continue. OK, let's look inward for a minute. Uh, Bill Murray has had a very di distinguished c career in terms of teaching, in terms of research, in terms of community service, political activity. Um, what enabled Dr. Bill Murray to jockey all these different activities and become such a success? Well, that's debatable. Some <laughs> of the things that you said are debatable. But uh, there's, a, there's a lot in being born at a, at a time which gives you a chance to do certain things. I was born at a time when, when, when I reached the age of 21 years, there happened to be a tremendous opening in ag economics. There were very few people in the field, and it just happened at that time there was a demand for it. One of the things that I feel about a person in his career is to analyze it in terms of his own ability and of the, the opportunities that are coming along. I could have gone into teaching economics instead of ag economics and I would have had a very uh, unattractive career compared to the one that I did have. Before I graduated, I had thought, well, I don't want to get into teaching because teaching is outside the area in which things happen. But once I got into the work in Iowa State College, I found that you could get involved in research and in action and making recommendations and in doing things. And I feel today, if I was, uh, if I was going into ag economics today, that I would certainly want to specialize, specialize in something in which I would become uh, as 
competent as anybody, there are so many different specialties that you can get into, even, for instance, in the area of computing. Just take this whole business of farm lending. There are some specialties there that a person could get into in farm appraisal in the field that I was in. I think the person today might find it a little more difficult than I did to get involved as, as fast, but with all the tools that you have, with the computer, and with the marvelous uh, things that you can now do, not only with the computer, but with mathematics and statistics, I feel there's a tremendous opportunity today for young people in ag economics. I like to think that this world is developing fast. And the reason it's developing fast is because there's so many tools being made available. And what is necessary for the young person who's graduating, like you, Jim, is to take into consideration your own abilities, your own interests, and then find a specialty and concentrate on it. And in your doctor's thesis, probably, go so far into that particular specialty that you'll know more than anybody else about that particular field. Now, once you've done that, the next thing you've got to do is to find somebody who wants that specialty. And that's not always the easiest thing. But on the other hand, it's possible that there's somebody, someplace, with all the various angles, new angles, on development. In other words, what you want to do is to find, follow the new angle. Remember that in 1925, instead of going into general economics, I went into ag economics. And ag economics is a specialty of general economics. So I'm very much concerned about the present agricultural economic graduate students concentrating on a specialty. Um, once I asked my son, who's an uh, orthopedic surgeon, I said, uh, maybe we should have general practitioners in medicine instead of some of you people who specialize so much. No, he said, specialization is the wave of the future. He said, you specialize. He said to me, he said, you didn't become a general econ economist. You specialized in ag economics. Well, then you didn't, you didn't just say ag economics. You decided to specialize in land economics. And you didn't decide just on land economics, but you decided on farm valuation and farm finance as two very small, really, but narrow specialties in the field of land economics, of agricultural economics. So he proved to me pretty much by logic that if you want to go places specialized, Okay, given the fact that you've essentially observed uh, the entire historical progression of the profession, I'm sure you've observed pitfalls, problems that have arose various times. If you were to counsel the profession on what to avoid, what directions to avoid, what would you say? What are the pitfalls? Well, that's a little difficult. I think I've given you uh, a positive thing, and that is this business of specializing. I suppose the pitfall can be that you get so enamored with some specialty that has no relevance to uh, the opportunity to have a, uh, a good job, that you can find yourself out on a limb sometimes. And there have been some people who have gone too far in a specialty in which uh, there really was no real purpose. In other words, you've got to keep your eyes open. You've got to see to it that what you do is going to be 
what somebody is going to want. And that goes back to the fact that once you get trained, you've got to find a job. If, you, if you're interested in following a profession of some kind and want to do a good job, you've got to see to it that there is going to be some demand for the kind of work that you want to do. Okay, since you retired uh, from actively teaching in 1974 from the Department of Economics at Iowa State University, you've been intimately involved in uh, the Living History Farms. Briefly uh, tell me about how you developed this brainchild and actually got the thing implemented. There's a combination uh, of things that result in the living history farms. While I was working on research, I was always a bit uh, critical of the ag experiment stations because they didn't stick their neck out on new experiments and having an experimental farm and trying things. So I was always interested in that aspect. I was also fascinated with the, um, the career that my grandfather had who took land over in Tama County and developed a farm out of it. It was nothing but prairie. There's a big story in our heritage, in the people who have gone before us out here in the Middle West. And so it seemed to me someday we ought to tell this story, not only of what had happened in the past, but also looking ahead to the future. And so what we're doing down here is developing what we call a 300-year walk. We start with the Indian site of 1700 and how the Indians raised corn and how they lived here. And then we go to the Pioneer Farm and we have an actual operating Pioneer Farm. Each day there's a meal cooked in the cabin, log cabin, and the farmer has oxen and he uses them and you can see them. This gives people some idea of how their great-grandfathers or grandfathers operated. And then you can go to where we're sitting today, right here at the Flynn Mansion, because this house where we're sitting was built in 1870. And Martin Flynn, who built this house, had a big shorthorn herd of cattle. And he was quite an operator in 1870. And we have a little town called Walnut Hill right next to the Flynn Mansion to show people what uh, the town business was like in the early days. And then we can go over to the 1900 farm, which we operate, which many people love to see who are older because they can relate to that farm. And the farmer over there does the things that the 1900 farmer does. He puts up hay in the barn the way they did it when I was a boy. They have a thrashing machine. And they thrash their oats like I used to be involved she notes on my grandfather's farm. And when I was on the farm, I always was uh, bragged up as being the best uh, straw stacker at thrashing time. And the reason they bragged me up was nobody really wanted to stack straw. <laughs> but since I was this, from the city, they uh, got me to go into that straw pile and tramp it down in the center so that it would shed water. And I, I, I fell for the bait, and I became the best straw sacker in North Tama County. Well, those days are interesting. There was, there's something too that we ought to preserve. And so when I, before, even before I retired, I saw that I wanted to do something after I retired. And fortunately, and here again, I think luck was with me. The time was right, and we have raised over $5 million here from various ways and have got the living history farms here in Des Moines operating. We haven't gotten near the things that we want yet, but we're on, we're on the way. And the most interesting phase of it is this farm of the future, farm demonstrations of the future, where we're trying to show some of the new things. We're just completing, we have our solar farm home where we're we're doing some of the newest things. For example, we have a salt water tank 
where we collect the heat during the summer and hold it to use it in the winter. There are all kinds of new things. We feel that a museum not only shows you the past, but it also should go into the future to show you what may happen. This is the kind of thing that we're doing down here at Living History Farms, and it's fascinating. It's marvelous. I've had really two lives. One, my econo ag economics teaching life, and now this Living History Farms life. And I'm, uh, I'm really very fortunate that I've been able to get in on this type of thing. It's the same way as I got in on the ag economics in the beginning, before it had really developed. People are interested in their past. And we need in Iowa someplace, a show place, where we can show what has happened here in agriculture over the last 150 years in this Middle West all the way from the open prairie to what we have today, and not only that, what we may have in the future. Okay, we have several minutes left. Is there anything you'd like to add as we close up this session? Yes, there is. Um, I've been very much impressed with the American Agricultural Economic Association progress. When you're involved in something as I was in the or organization in its earlier years, the period in which I was most active was from 1930 to 1950, those 20 years. And in those 20 years, uh, we were just a young organization. And fortunately, fortunately, we were able to blend together. We put together two groups, the agronomy farm management group that were interested in practical agriculture, and the ag economic, the group that came in from economics, more philosophical. And we got those two together, and we accomplished something which I would call similar to hybrid vigor, heterosis, the geneticists called it. You get two groups of different ideas, but if you get them together and blend them together, you get uh, an increase in productivity, hybrid vigor. And that's what the association has had and has had all those years. I know when we had, we had our annual meeting in 1948 at uh, Lake Geneva in Wisconsin. I, at, at that meeting, we had the principal speaker, and the president was responsible for getting the principal speaker. And you wouldn't guess who I had. I got E.G. Norse, the man who inspired me to go into ag economics. And at that time, he was the first president of the Council of Economic Advisors, in that case, for President Truman. And he came out and gave us a marvelous, uh, marvelous address. So uh, what I'm hoping is that the association will continue as it, as it is doing in showing this hybrid vigor of blending many different types of activity, extension, teaching, and research and not only the statistical side, but also the qualitative side of economics. The, 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 uh, the future of our association is in continuing in that direction of including people who are out in business, ag business, as well as the man who is in the ivory tower and the man who is doing research in ag economics. The association has a great future. And I've been, I've been so satisfied and proud of the fact that I had a chance to be in it. Thank you. Thank you.